All right, guys, this is take four of the Haller Hustle Comic Book Haul of April 2015, okay? Last week and a half, if not longer, I have been really under the weather. Uh, <laughs> uh, I know I had a slight fever because the first time I tried this video to show this, this haul that I picked up before I was sick at a couple of different places, I was just out of my mind. I, I, I was downstairs on the couch. I'm like, oh, God, set up. And I set up. And I'm like, shoot a video. You can do this. You know, being all stubborn, not wanting to you know, give in and say that I was sick. Uh, I was just getting worse and worse where um, it turned into bronchitis. And um, I was out of my mind in that video. I went back and watched it, and I didn't post it because I was like, I don't remember saying that. And I was just saying some off-the-wall crap. And I had my window um, open that day. Uh, the sun was actually out, and some people pulled up outside in the parking lot and they were watching me film while I was doing this and I was getting distracted and I didn't remember doing this but th there reached a point where I was like showing some of these books talking about them and I was holding my hand up the whole time flipping them off I mean I was like whoa and then so this is my getting back in the saddle and make a YouTube video you've done this before but the, the first couple the tries that I've tried tonight just not up there you know on par you know I didn't have to admit it or anything like that but uh, this is the first day I have felt normal my ears are still stopped up I feel like I'm talking in a bucket I still got that cloud in my brain that makes me feel like I'm a little detached so this could be some fun you know or maybe not you know so we'll see what I can remember these came from a few places around Bluefield West Virginia Princeton uh, West Virginia I live on the Virginia side and it's about a 30 mile drive 30 mile drive to the state line but uh, first uh, thing that I bought was an antique shop I only got two books there I think these came to a dollar but this is from the Helix line of comics from the late 90s, uh, 98, I think 97, from Helix Comics. It was a short-lived imprint that DC did. Uh, but this was Michael Moorcock writing three stories per uh, issue, sort of an anthology series. My, uh, Walt Simonson did the art. He did the art for uh, he did the art for the covers and for one of the stories in there. And anytime Michael Moorcock writes anything that involves Elric and Elric's multiverse of the Internal Champion. You know, the characters are all different versions of the Eternal Champion who is Elric. So they always tie into his novels and stuff. You know, that's, that's the rule of thumb with him. So we got number two and number four. And I read some of these around 2000, but I was a, you know, new dad and all that stuff. And I was just getting what was easily accessible, you know, moonbeams and roses. Uh, I remember this one was actually pretty good, you know, so there's that. Then I went down to a place called Ollie's. And Ollie's has the this little section in their books. And they get these uh, grab bags of 10 books that you buy for, we're going to say $5.99 to be sure. So I already did my math wrong. You know, these, but this was on a whim. A lot of people, they have a sign up, don't open the bags. But people open the bags first thing, make their 10, go pay for them. So I just went through the bags that are already open and got like some stuff I wanted to try out. This wasn't a serious thing. And it was just to kill the monotony kind of thing. You know, let's, let's just do this, right? <coughs> so these 10 books... This is from Boom Studios, I believe. Yeah, uh, in, Incorruptible, number 23. It's basically just a whole big fight issue. Uh, but basically the concept behind this, and I'm going to talk fast because I've got a lot to get through and I don't want to make a long video, is that, um, oh my gosh, the main character, Max uh, Damage, Max Damage, get it, Maximum Damage, <coughs> was a villain. And maybe he was the arch enemy. I've never read anyone but this, so I'm going by the flat, what I kind of picked up. But the Plutonian was the superhero, and he was like a Superman type, archetype. And he freaking somehow killed like a million people right in front of uh, Max Damage. And so Max Damage is like this badass villain who all of a sudden turns into a good guy. And his, his journey of being that good guy. And it's called Ir Incorruptible. Now, I, I liked this era of Mark Wade's writing because he started playing with ideas of villains and heroes. Uh, not only did he do that sort of thing where he kind of switched what if a villain goes good for real, he all, around the same time, uh, he probably, he, I don't know, around the same time, but within you know a certain amount of time there, he did the Empire series where it was what if a super villain actually took over the world. Anyway, I grabbed this. Uh, I'm always intrigued when they bring the new universe at Marvel in any comics. I'm not going to go on my rant about Marvel right now. But um, from what I can pick up, this is my second issue of John of Hickman's John Hick, Jonathan Hickman's Avengers, where we see the Star Brand and the Night Mask. But it's like it's part of the Marvel Universe, and 
I, I haven't picked up if they're acknowledging the fact that the Star Brand was already in the Avengers comics and in Quasar. Quasar brought the Star Brand from the New Universe to the Marvel Universe. They even had a great big, uh, huge crossover event with tie-ins called Star Blast. So maybe it's one of those things where you got to turn off your brain. I'm not going to lie. I'm not really impressed with Hickman's Avengers, but you know, gotta, I got to give it a chance. You know, I don't want to be all negative. Uh, John Burns. Um, you know, he gets a lot of work at IDW because the publisher or the owner or the some, you know, guy way up there in the echelon is, a, you know, just a burn fan. So he gets a lot of work. But this was Star Trek Assignment Earth number one. And this is based on Gary Seven from the original Star Trek uh, TV show that had Terry Gar in it. Uh, it take, took place in 1968 and it had Gary Seven, who's kind of like this space uh futuristic space secret agent who kind of makes sure that you know the evolution of man goes right or something you gotta go watch it <coughs> and i've got it on vhs i love that episode of gary seven uh this was a king kong adaption done in the early 90s it has a dave stevens cover uh don simpson the guy who does megaton man and uh normal man uh underground artist donald simpson he did the art and adapted it and i thought i grabbed three two two three more issues of this but apparently i just grabbed this one so they'll be there grabbed uh, x-men of space if you will dc's omega men number 10 number 12 excuse me i'm starting to kind of get a collection of those up Early, uh, no, yeah, early issue uh, issue of Exiles. I'm starting to get a little collection of this up finally. John, of uh, Judd Winnick, who started the book, uh, number 35. I have to sit down and read those. And again, I'm getting a little collection of this up. These are falling into my lap left and right, Rising Stars. I wasn't into it when it came out. But this was the book that Wizard Magazine was saying, could this be the book that finally knocks Watchmen off as, you know, greatest comic of all time and we saw how that what happened there time is told uh world war hulk number three the last great crossover event at marvel i do believe and they act like it never happened then i grabbed two issues of silver war uh which you know i could rip this thing apart going by marvel's own rules with their continuity but i won't do that they were there you know i think i don't know i don't know how i got them all right and then uh let me, let me look here make sure i'm keeping this straight and then I went to that flea market. I should have opened up with these, okay? And in the parking lot, this guy of the flea market, the flea market is so full, they have people out in the parking lot. I just happened to be looking by just in case, you know, somebody might have had something. And I looked down and I saw these three books. He wanted a dollar a piece. I got them for two bucks a piece. And I looked at them and apparently these are the real deal, okay? The Pogo Papers, first edition from 1953. Got this for a, a buck, you know? And if I didn't have so many books, I'd show you the inside. But, uh... Pogo was a, a strip in newspapers that had political overtones and stuff, and Walt Kelly, who did these, has been a huge influence. I mean, if you know the names Carl Barks, Jeff Smith, um, Bone, things like that, this was a huge influence. Even Alan Moore's a fan. Now, Alan Moore had an issue in his Swamp Thing run in the 80s where a spaceship came down that was a turtle, and these creatures came out that were in full-bodied uh, space suits and you knew it was the characters of pogo you know but that was from 1953 this is a second print from 1955 of potluck pogo i went through i've looked at i've looked through them uh the copyright dates say they're that old so i was i'm very happy to find those then i got this peanuts the gospel of peanuts and i thought it was just going to be a reprint edition from the 60s of you know strips of the of peanuts of charlie brown and snoopy and it turns out yes they have panels and strips and stuff but this guy with this guy uh, Robert Short, who has a PhD in theological studies, uh, he he gets he goes through and he grabs some of Charles Schultz's strips of peanuts, and then he goes into uh, annotations from the Bible that Schultz is referring to, and gets into big discussions. I think it'll be interesting reading. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, and then there was the uh, Mercer Mall. Uh, this is actually two separate hauls. There's a set of books that I forgot to put in the video, but I catch this guy. They have a card show every now and then at the mall, and some people have some comic book boxes there and stuff. And it's just luck when I get there and I find them. Sure, yeah. So uh, basically, I got these for, I caught them on a Sunday. So, you know, a couple months ago, I got these for a quarter a piece. Uh, John Burns uh, Demon Run with Will Pfeiffer doing the scripting. Uh, you know, I figured why not? You know, I've went through all those boxes i might as well get something while i'm there i heard these were not very good but i'm real 
I'm curious about John Byrne's designs for some of the demons and monsters that pop up. They all seem to have a Lovecraftian feel to them, you know, so I don't know if that's a Hellboy thing or if John Byrne was, you know, being John Byrne, I don't know. And of course we get Superman and Wonder Woman in there, the book he worked on in the 80s and the book he worked on in the 90s. Uh, see what I mean about the Cthulhu, uh, not Cthulhu, but the Lovecraftian feel, you know. And of course, we get the Spectre in there with uh, you know another Jerry Siegel creation there, same guy that created Superman, created Spectre. Okay, let's get these out of the way. Now we're at the flea market stuff where all these books I traded for. Okay, all these were traded for, um, and I finally just went in there and got pretty much almost every book I wanted. I'm like, let's just come in. I grabbed a whole bunch of books that I knew I couldn't get rid of and probably never read again or anything like that. So I was like, okay, let's do this. And what was ironic is that I went ahead and grabbed back my Eternal Warrior 1 or two, one and 2 that I had traded him the previous time I was there, which is funny, you know. So, yeah, I had the early Valiant uh, books from the 90s also. Okay, so uh, some of the things... Uh, oh, wait a minute. Also, well, anyway... Here's some stuff here. This is uh, Universe X Omnibus. I have a thicker, thick edition of this over here on the bookshelf. But when Universe X came out, they released, um, okay, like the pencils. This is the John Romita uh, pencils that he did in a uh, Spidey a Universe X one shot that he did of what if Peter had married Gwen. And we see them, you know, Harry and Mary Jane and Gwen Stacy if they had aged and everything. I forgot that was in there. And then, you know, we get the Alex Ross concepts and background information and hints to get us curious about it. And I love that Alex Ross stuff. And then when I think comic book art, I think Al Williamson, Russ Heath, Russ Manning, um, you know, guys like that, Al Williamson. And here's a guy, this is from PC Comics in 1983, Thrillology. I have seen this cover before, but I never got a hold of the book. I was really happy to get this. The artwork is by Tim Conrad, and I think he also wrote this. And I flipped through it, and the artwork is that consistent through the book. Uh, it's just beautiful. That's something I can just flip through for hours and hours, over and over. Okay. All right, we'll do some DC stuff here real quick. Now, you're going to be seeing a lot of Legion stuff here pretty soon for me. I'm going to start getting you know my Legion of Superheroes back up. But here's Legion of Superheroes number 48 from the 90s. This is where this is the series that came out of the 80s when they went five years forward and made it really dark and gritty and nobody used their superhero names. They used their real names. If you remember the Legion, Keith Giffen did the art up to about issue 25 and then they lightened the tone. So that's number 48. And then they came out with the Legionnaires that spun out of there where there's the younger kids. They didn't know if they were clones or not or what was going on, but uh, it's well over by the time they got to the Emerald, Emerald Wars. Uh, you know, number 49. You know, I could talk about those forever. Then I got found this. This is number 38. I think this is of uh, Justice League of America from the 2000s. And I think this is James Robinson in Mark Bagley's first issue, which, you know, whoop de doo you know. But uh, the reason I grabbed it is because it's an unofficial Blackest Night crossover. So there you go. All right, got to get moving here. And then I grabbed this. This is JLA that preceded the Justice League of America book. This is the one that started in the 90s by Grant Morrison and then Mark Wade took over before Joe Kelly came on. And we got number 47 going into Wade's second story. Uh, the Once Upon a Time story. I don't know what it was really called. But it has Brian Hitch art before he went on to the... Uh, Ultimates at Marvel. So, <coughs> all right. Let me look here. All right, and the rest of this stuff is indie stuff, more Michael Moorcock stuff, more uh, adaptions of his Eternal Champion works, uh, Hawk Moon, Jewel of the Skull, uh, not as well known as Eric 2 and 4, except it has uh, huge fans like uh, Hawk Moon, has fans like Hawkwind and stuff, actual bands who sing about that stuff. Uh, some Comico stuff here. Frank Thorne uh, did four issues of, of uh, Ribbit, who, when I look at her, it's a green red Sonya that rides a skateboard. I have number two and four, so I just need number three. I have number one on the shelves. Uh, if Frank Thorne is there, I am there. Uh, you, got, got, you have guys like Ad Hughes and Frank Cho who draw beautiful women and stuff, and then before him, you had like Frank Frazetta, uh, Jack Davis, a bunch of guys who, you know, they weren't officially, you know, bad girl artists, but with me, it's, uh, you know, Frank Thorne. 
And then thanks to, I'm not going to show all the covers to this one, but thanks to Comic Hoarder um, 410, he got me interested, man, in, in getting these because I had just seen them a week before he posted his videos on these. But they were Robotech. And in the 80s, I did not have access to the cartoon. I did not have access to Comico or First Comics or anything like that. But when it came to this Robotech, I saw the Battletech role-playing fighting game. It was more of a fighting game. I don't think, you know, I saw, I knew people who played it, and I saw their setups and everything. And then I heard people talking about Robotech. And back then, you could only get this stuff on satellite when it was the big dishes that were probably like six feet in diameter and had a motor that actually turned them so you could face the satellite and all this stuff. And they would come, you know, school, talk about Robotech, and I was getting Robotech and Battletech put up. But apparently the Macross series is what you want to get, according to Comic Order 14, if I remember. But uh, here's Robotech Masters. Uh, I got quite a few of these. Okay. If I go through them all, this video is going to take forever. But I got uh, Robotech Masters. And I'm not a huge fan of uh, of uh, Japanimation, manga, anime. When there's something I like, I like Vampire Hunter D, Battle of the Planets, Nausicaa, Spirited Away, Star, uh, Star Avengers, Dangard Ace, Raiden. Um, Manger Z, you know, I like the old school stuff, I do like it. Then I got Return to Macross, the Robotech series, a couple of issues of it, you know, uh, get that glare off there, sorry guys, you know, uh, you know, this is piecemeal, and then I got the Macross series, uh, most of these are in the 20s, and apparently, you know, I have one here that's not bagged and stuff, but uh, these had wraparound covers. In the general plot, I looked up one of the cartoons on YouTube. You can find the cartoons on YouTube of uh, Robotech. And I also understand that, uh, you know, I could imagine that. I remember all these Japanese cartoons. One of the reasons I didn't like them, the stories didn't flow, and they felt real uh, scattered and all over the place. And that was because of the dubbing, the translation, and the way that they chop up Japanese uh, imported cartoons and stuff for American audiences and stuff. So it wasn't, I, I didn't realize that when I watched it, but I could tell that this was just a mess, and that was probably why, but uh, I forgot what I was saying with that. All right, then uh, I have friends, I have a friend who is a huge John Ostrander fan. He uh, recommended the Spectre books. I finally read a few of those that he wrote in the 90s. I read, a, the biggest thing I read of his was the Suicide Squad in the 80s. But this is some first comics of his stuff uh, during the American Flag, uh, American Flag time. Scout time, you know, a lot of these indie books were hitting, the great black and white series were hitting, but it's Grim Jack, and it's time for, I mean, anybody I know who actually does read Grim Jack and know who he is, and this stuff was just not available to me growing up. I have no idea, and I've dodged it like the plague and all this stuff, but apparently this is the stuff, okay, but, uh, you know, a lot of uh, Grim Jack books. I, grab, I have one or two up here on the shelves, but I grabbed them because, like, Fred Hembeck did a... Uh, uh, back issue story. I mean, he's a really interesting looking character here. Um, no idea what it's about or anything. And it's one of those things where I might want to write down how I interpret his look and say what my idea is and maybe write it down. The Lady Killers. I mean, he's part cowboy, part cavalier. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Apparently there's monsters. It's sci-fi, but is it in space? Or, you know, is it in the future? I have no idea. I don't know. Which is kind of cool, man. It's kind of cool to find something old but new, you know. Uh, they're sticking together. So, you know, so, you know. But like I said, there's, you know, people are grabbing these up left and right. The 80s market for these indie books that came out uh, seemed to really be uh, starting to dry up. Now, I'll grab these because it's Grimjack case files. No idea what this is about either, but it's got Tim Truman art and Jim Ostrander. So I grabbed those, and uh, you know, and then they have really cool ads on the back of some of these that just makes me just enough curious to wonder about these other books. You know, met metaphor, metaphor, no metaphor, get it? I don't know, never heard of it. Anyway, but uh, yeah, hopefully they're there's they're good. There's his Spectre stuff that I finally started reading from the '90s by Jim Ostrander. Superb stuff. Should have been a Vertigo book. All right, and then I got Scout, post-apocalyptic uh, tales of an Apache uh, Native American, and I'm not saying that to be PC, but uh, you know Tim Truman doing his thing, just love that post-apocalyptic stuff. 
Um, I've had this run before. I've got the first five or six signed by Tim Truman. Um, yeah, it was Tim Truman. Yeah, I met him at Heroes Con. And now it's time for me to get these back, you know. And uh, Eclipse Comics was always for, you know, creator's rights and stuff. Because when Marvel Comics announced their 25th anniversary, they said, well, what about Jack? And I'll put that in another video. All right, guys, we made it. I'm happy with this video. I'm going to upload it. There you go. All right, I'm back. May get more of a haul this weekend. I've been invited to go down to a small con in Winston-Salem. We'll see how the health is. We'll see how the money is. And, you know, might pop up in there. I've already missed one con, you know, one convention around here. But I, apparently I didn't die. I turned the salt and just melted away. All right, guys, later on.